Derivatives are financial contracts that derive their value from an underlying security and have existed for as long as markets have. A futures contract, for example, is a legal agreement to buy or sell a particular commodity or security at a predetermined price at a specified time in the future. The buyer of the futures contract has the right to buy and receive the underlying asset when the futures contract expires, and the seller has the obligation to deliver the underlying asset at the expiration date. These contracts have been around for millennia, with the earliest recorded example dated to 1750 BC in Mesopotamia, or modern-day Iraq. Say you're in a casino and you want to make money off of a poker game, but you are barred from playing the actual game. So you grab another patron and tell him you'd like to make a bet on the outcome of the game. You believe that your friend Ali will win, so you're willing to pony up $100 to bet on her winning. In this example, the bet you make is the derivative, and the underlying securities returns are the results of the game. Seeing your derivative bet, two other people get interested. They don't want to bet on the game, rather they want to gamble on the outcome of your bet. They create their own bet, weighing probabilities and putting in funds accordingly. This is a second order derivative. In the modern financial markets, since over-the-counter derivatives are lightly regulated due to the Commodities Futures Modernization Act, CFMA, this process can continue ad infinitum. When creating a portfolio, most investors worry about their loss exposure. Buying any single equity is risky, and it's reasonable to want to reduce downside risk. This is part of the reason why derivatives were created. Through hedging, traders were able to change their gross exposure into a net exposure. Net exposure underlines the difference between a hedge fund's long positions and its short stock or derivative positions. Once calculated, the net exposure of a fund is usually expressed as a percentage, displaying the fund's risk with regard to market fluctuations. Let's break it down. Say you are bullish on IBM. You go out and buy $50 million of long-dated call options. Since you're afraid of losing money in case IBM misses its earning call, loses revenue, or experiences some other negative event while your position is open, you go and buy $40 million of put options with the same expiry date. Thus, your new net exposure position is only $10 million long. Using this mechanism, traders were able to hedge positions and reduce their theoretical risk. When you buy calls and puts, this net exposure is reduced, and at the same time, your assets increase. In this example, your gross exposure will increase as long as you own both long calls and long puts. Since both these options have value that you paid for, and represent the right to exercise at strike, they are both recorded as assets on your balance sheet. You own $50 million of calls and $40 million of puts, putting your overall derivative gross exposure to $90 million. However, your net exposure would only be $10 million. Thus, you have $90 million of assets, subject to market changes of course, and a net risk of only $10 million. There are three interrelated ways this goes seriously wrong. One is counterparty risk. A counterparty is someone who takes the opposite side of your trade, so if you are buying, they are the seller, and vice versa. In derivatives, if the counterparty to your trade fails, i.e. goes bankrupt, the contract will most likely not be honored. This means that if you are a hedge fund and you bought options written with a single counterparty, like Bear Stearns, these securities will now be worth nothing. The $90 million gross exposure loss would represent an 800% higher drop than the theoretical maximum loss of $10 million, which is your net exposure. If an options clearinghouse which is the counterparty to all listed options fails, millions of contracts would be worthless. The true risk is counterparty risk. This is what the models do not understand. Another way this goes wrong is if the underlying fails. The results are equally catastrophic. Going back to the poker game analogy, imagine if the people playing the actual game left the table. Now derivative bet number one is worthless since there's nothing to bet on. Same goes with derivative bets two, three, and so on. If the poker game had $25 in the pot and each derivative bet had $100 in the pot, this means that just by one game ending, $325 worth of value was destroyed. 
This is the explosive nature of derivatives. Let's use the 2008 financial crisis as an example. A homeowner goes out and gets a loan. The mortgage originator then sells that loan to an investment bank who creates a CDO out of it. Then another bank comes along and creates a synthetic CDO and then takes out a credit default swap on it. This creates insane leverage to the underlying and horribly dangerous results if the underlying collapses. Dr. Trimbath puts it like this in Naked, Short and Greedy. I've tried to say this in different ways to make it as clear as possible, and I think the best way to look at it is to recognize that the problem that you see and talk about on the equity side is multiplied a hundred times in the bond markets and then another 15 times through credit default swaps. Basically, for every one dollar in real value that any company or country puts into the financial markets, brokers are ramping it up and trading something like 1,875% of it. Another way to look at it is that if a homeowner defaults on a $100,000 mortgage, it can do $1,875,000 worth of damage to the financial markets. A third way the system can blow up is due to cross-collateralization where one asset is pledged to multiple entities, creating more claims than assets that exist. This process is actually very common in the futures markets. Bullion banks, for example, which hold gold and silver, will write between 2 to 10 futures contracts for every one ounce of gold in the vaults. They can do this since the vast majority of the futures, 85 to 90 percent, never get called in for settlement and are instead rolled forward. This basically means that when the old contract is about to expire, the holder sells it for cash and then uses this money to buy a new futures contract with a different expiration date. Thus, the bullion bank writing all these futures never has to actually deliver the underlying, the gold in this case. If all the futures contracts they write were called in at once, then the one ounce of gold is delivered to the buyer and the bank who wrote the contract is unhooked to deliver all remaining five ounces to the firms that are owed they would be forced to go into the market to purchase. This is called a contract delivery squeeze. If the bullion bank fails, all the futures written by it are now null and void, and the firms that weren't able to take delivery get nothing. The recent Archegos Capital debacle was a classic example of the destructive power of derivatives. Using contracts like total return swaps, Bill Huang was able to leverage his fund more than eight times making bets on the performance of a variety of Chinese and American equities. When these equities lost value, his fund was obliterated. A mere 12.5% drop in the underlying resulted in a complete loss of capital. However, his firm wasn't the only one affected. Credit Suisse was its counterparty, and thus they have lost more than $5.5 billion and counting. If derivatives are an explosive bottle, counterparty risk is a fuse one that always runs to another bottle of nitroglycerin. The modern financial system is effectively a massive network of institutions tied to each other through these complex derivative contracts. GSIBs, globally systemic important banks, are the largest entities in the system. The derivatives market is gargantuan. The Bank of International Settlements estimated the total notional value of all outstanding OTC derivatives to be $640 trillion in 2019. And this figure doesn't even include exchange-listed derivatives like most common option contracts. More sober estimates put it somewhere north of one quadrillion dollars. Numbers of the size are hard to wrap your head around. This is equivalent to a million billion or a thousand trillion. For reference, the United States economy is around 22 trillion and the world economy is estimated to be 88 trillion. Thus, global GDP could fit into the notional derivatives market 11 times over and still not reach it. Every single bank is exposed, either directly or indirectly, to this market. For example, Deutsche Bank alone has over $47 trillion in notional gross exposure, twice the size of the entire American economy. Through the magic of financial engineering, Deutsche is able to create a net exposure of only $22 billion, equivalent to 0.046% of the notional. Thus, although on paper its risk is extremely small, the actual risk to the firm is enough to wipe it out basically overnight. This is what happened to institutions like AIG in the 2008 financial crisis. They insured more products than they could ever cover, 
and when the firms they insured came calling, they were quickly forced into bankruptcy, requiring a $182 billion bailout from the Federal Reserve. If the hedge funds with derivatives exposure, like Archegos, are the equivalent of an office rigged with nitroglycerin, the banks are stadiums full of 50-gallon drums, and the DTC, FICC, and OCC are the equivalent of a nuke. Counterparty risk, in the form of fuses, runs between all of them. What happens when enough factors in the system start to apply too much pressure? Boom. Why hasn't anything happened? This is the question most people ask themselves when they first learn about this derivatives monster. The reason is actually very simple. As long as money keeps flowing into the casino, the gamblers feel little risk, so no one pulls out. The Fed continues to print money, equity and bond prices continue to rise, and since there's no risk of the underlying falling of value, everyone keeps their money in the pot, and the poker game continues. The profits made from derivatives trading are enormous, and any bank that abstained would quickly lose investors, because they would instantly withdraw their capital and take it to another bank to maximize their returns. It's all a confidence game. As long as everyone feels assured, prices keep rising, cash keeps pumping in, and the party will continue. Warren Buffett famously turned down calls to buy Lehman Brothers during the darkest days of the 2008 financial crisis. He understood a key concept, that derivatives, especially when they make up the majority of your fund, are equivalent to financial weapons of mass destruction, able to destroy investment firms and indeed entire systems in one fell swoop. In the tumultuous month of October 2008, this derivatives market was beginning to unravel. The money draining out of the financial system due to bank runs and frozen credit lending started to light fires in multiple institutions. The bombs that were Bear Stearns, AIG, and Lehman had already blown up, and the fire was spreading through counterparty risk throughout the system. In fact, we were getting dangerously close to hitting the switch on the nuclear warhead. As Timothy Geithner, then president of the New York Fed, put it, we were a few days away from the ATMs not working. And the worst part of all of this? Even to this day, regulators, and indeed even financial industry insiders, are completely blind to the risk. OTC derivatives are essentially unregulated. No one knows the true size of the market. Worse yet, the traders inside the bank are using optimistic versions of the efficient market hypothesis and VAR models to estimate their risk. Their risk estimates come out to essentially zero due to probability models and net exposure hedging. Thus, they pile on more risk every single day, ensuring that the problem continues to get worse until the entire system explodes. The modern international financial system, unhinged from the fetters of regulation and oversight, has created a derivatives monster whose tendrils reach across the globe. Fed by the incessant money printer and holding the retirement funds of generations, this machine continues to bet in ever-increasing amounts in the greatest casino ever created. This monster, as long as it is nourished by cheap credit and ever-increasing flows of cash from the Federal Reserve, will continue to grow. This is why the Fed is in the endgame. They know that they cannot turn off the liquidity hose as they would risk destroying the system in its entirety. They have to convince themselves and the market with constant assurances that inflation will remain low, risk is non-existent, and that their balance sheet can continue to grow forever without consequence. Secretly, they are starting to realize that they are in a burning building with no way out.